Welcome to our monthly AAA podcast, Affinity, Allie, and Annette, On the Road to Good Storytelling, with your hosts, Allie Spooner and Annette Morey. Welcome. I'm Allie Spooner, and I write with Affinity. Uh, with over 30 published titles, I touch on many genres from romance to paranormal. I have numerous series, and lately I've focused more on teaching myself to write short stories and standalone books. I hope you enjoy our podcast and have an opportunity to meet some new authors to you or to learn more to about your favorites. Uh, we appreciate your support and invite you to visit Affinity Rainbow Publications to check out our books. And I'm Annette Morey, uh, author with Affinity Rainbow Publications. I'm pretty sure I've settled into kind of a brand of quirky, unconventional uh, style of writing, which uh, I know causes my publisher fits, uh, but that's just who I am. After uh, 30 published novels, I finally feel like I might be a real author, but I'm always looking to learn from others. So these podcasts have been super fun and super, super illuminating as we ask other uh, great writers like Chris to uh, join us. Hello. Hi, I'm Chris Bryant. <laughs> I feel like I'm slacking because I have um, 20 books and y'all have 30. So I need to catch up. Yeah, oh, I, you do. I, your your I, fans I and readers will say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, each month we'll invite a special guest to join us as we discuss various topics of interest to readers and writers. We'll invite our guests to do a short reading and then follow with questions on the featured topic while encourage them to do at least one giveaway to our audience. And this month, we'll be talking about books with country charm, a popular setting for many women-loving women books. We feel so honored to have Chris join us and talk about her wonderful book, Home. It's a charming novel with uh, country charm in it. Uh, we all know Allie Spooner writes uh, numerous books about strong Southern women and her latest story from Cradle from the Cradle to the Stone features small town living and country charm as well. Both will be blessing us with a short reading from the books with country charm. I almost wore a baseball cap uh, today, but I, I didn't. <laughs> you would have been allowed. <laughs> uh, following our podcast, we'll upload to a newly created YouTube channel and hope you consider subscribing so you never miss a future podcast. Once again, our special guest today is Chris Bryant, a multi-award winning author. Uh, she was born in Tacoma, Washington, yay, Washington State, <laughs> but has lived all over the world and now considers Kansas City her home. I cannot understand why you moved from Washington State to Kansas City. Mm, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that later. She received her BA in English from the University of Missouri and spends a lot of her time buried in books. She enjoys hiking, photography, spending time with her family and her dog, Molly, who gets more attention than she does on Facebook. Yes, I've seen Molly. Yes. Quite Molly, cute. yeah, she has quite the following. It's funny. I can uh, I can post something on Twitter about, hey, Molly says hi, and she gets like 150 likes. And then I could be like, <laughs> hey, I have a new book coming out, and I get like 30 likes. So, I mean... Yeah. My yeah. dog wins every time. And I'm okay with that because she's adorable. Well, yeah, you, might have to, you might have to bring uh, Molly into the, the podcast and show her off a little later. If uh, oh, Molly would even know. On occasion, my cats will walk through and uh, meow in the background. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. All right. So without further ado, oh. Chris, you're on. Take it away. Okay, so I am going to read the first chapter from my small town holiday romance called Home. Here's what it looks like. Super cute, super cute girl, super cute dog. I mean, you can't go wrong. Lesbians and dogs. I mean, really? That's a thing. That should be a trope. I think it is a trope. I've made it a trope. Um, okay, so my story, I'm going to go ahead and read the blurb uh, of this book. 
To say Sheriff Natalie Strand is shocked that Sarah Eastman, the girl who kissed her at a high school party, is back in town would be a huge understatement. Between Sarah's return and a stray dog that gets the best of her, Natalie's world is suddenly turned upside down. They say you can't go home again, but that's exactly what Sarah does when she returns to Spruce Mountain, Oregon, to live with her aunt and uncle after her divorce. All she wants is peace and to ensure her daughter Harley has stability. Seeing Natalie again after 17 years ignites a passion that she hasn't felt in a long time. Never mind that her heart tumbles in her chest or that she forgets words when Natalie's around. She needs to focus on her family and getting her life back together. Natalie and Sarah are about to discover that anything is possible when love takes the long way home. So, chapter one. Natalie pulled up the collar of her coat and crossed her arms to ward off the late October chill that crept inside the sleeves and around her neck. This was her least favorite time of year, when leaves and bushes browned and shriveled before the grayness of winter set in. Everyone loved the fall, but she hated the cold. Spruce Mountain, Oregon had all four seasons, and Natalie hated two. She crossed the street and stopped to pet a beautiful golden retriever waiting outside the craft store where she was headed on her lunch break. Look at you, you're so pretty. Are you Greta's new helper? A tiny nagging feeling tugged at her when she noticed it wasn't wearing a collar. She gave the dog a quick rub with both hands as if to warm it and turned to march into the store to find out who had left their dog outside. She pushed the door open and smiled at the warmth that greeted her. Greta, this is my favorite store on Maine. It's always warm and smells like pumpkin bread. Greta Bowman, owner of Creative Crafts, greeted her with a big smile. Sheriff, you're always welcome here, especially with the big drop in temperature today. As sheriff of a small town, population 1,880, Natalie was hyper aware of anything out of the ordinary. She knew most of the residents and business owners. The town had, excuse me. Uh, the town was the town was comfortable borderline boring with the occasional public intoxication or disorderly conduct sprinkled in to keep her from doubting all of life's choices and choosing a career that wasn't overly exciting i can't believe how cold it is it's not even november do you know whose retriever that is out there greta looked around the store no but we only have a few customers right now mrs bennett and another young woman you can ask them she pointed to the back of the store. Now let me go get your mother's order. I'll be right back. Natalie nodded and worked her way over to Mrs. Bennett, who was perusing the yard, the yards of buffalo check flannel. Oh no, dear, that's not my dog. Brutus is home in bed. You remember Brutus, right? Mrs. Bennett asked. She had a chihuahua she had carried in her purse until the dog's old bones couldn't handle the slight sway to and fro. Now Brutus stayed at home when she ran her errands. That sweet boy, give him a pat and on the head from me. The fact that Brutus was still alive surprised her. She remembered when he was an eight-week-old puppy. Back then, Mrs. Bennett was her physical science teacher. She showed up at their high school graduation with him, much to the delight of everyone in attendance. Who could resist a puppy the size of a teacup? That was 17 years ago. She smiled at Mrs. Bennett and circled the store to find the other patron Greta pointed out and located a petite brunette bent over a bin of buttons. Excuse me, miss, is that your dog outside? The brunette stood up and turned. Natalie took a step back and then another. She knew the face, those eyes, those full red lips. Time spun backward and suddenly it was 17 years ago and she was at Ellie Shepard's graduation party, party staring at the same soft brown eyes after experiencing the best kiss of her life. Oh my God, Nat, is that you? Warm hands grabbed her and squeezed. Natalie blinked and stumbled over words tumbling in her head. Sarah, hi, what are you doing here? She clamped her mouth shut and forced a smile. I mean, what brings you back to Spruce Mountain? Sarah Eastman was even more beautiful than the day she left. The innocence and softness of her youth had been replaced by stronger, more, notice more noticeable curves and a thinner, more mature face. Her beautiful dark hair now had caramel highlights and brushed her shoulders. Everything about her still took Natalie's breath away. I moved back to regroup. Spruce Mountain was always the closest thing to home for me, Sarah said. They were still holding hands. Nally relaxed her grip and dropped the physical connection. Your aunt and uncle still live here, right? She knew the answer because she had just seen them at the town meeting earlier in the month. Maintaining eye contact with Sarah was tough. She hated that all the confidence she'd built up over the last decade crumbled as she stood in front of the girl who had kissed her once and never looked back. Yes, we're staying with them until we can find a place ourselves or until I can figure out my life. 
Sarah tucked a piece of hair behind her ear with a shaky hand and broke eye contact. The word we hit Natalie in the gut and caused her heart to slip down to her stomach. It wasn't as if she pined for Sarah over the last 20 or so years of her life or compared every girlfriend she ever had to her, but Sarah had set the bar high the second their lips touched so many years ago. Oh, that's great. I'm sure you'll figure something out. She told herself to quit nodding at Sarah. I guess I'll go. I guess I'll see you around. Let's have lunch this week and catch up. Sheriff, are you in town? Fred just called. Sarah, <clears throat> excuse me. Sheriff, are you in town? Fred just called. Said something <clears throat> happened at the market. Natalie's shoulders, shoulder walkie-talkie boomed in the awkward silence that settled between them. Something always happened to Natalie when she got a call. The adrenaline rush kicked her confidence up a notch, and her heart, which was already beating at an alarming rate, fluttered faster. She reached up and pressed the button and answered, fully aware she was still staring at Sarah. I'm not too far away. I'll be there in 10. She released the button to end the call. I'd better go. It's nice to see you again. Every part of her hummed with excitement, and a heated rush of anxiety flowed through her veins at seeing Sarah again. Greta appeared. Here's your mother's order. Be sure to tell her I said hello. Greta's interruption gave Natalie an excuse to get out of there before she did or said something stupid. She took the bag from Greta and nodded to both women as she created space. Spruce Market was within walking distance, but she couldn't go on a call with a giant bag of material slung over her shoulder. Plus, she needed time to process the last five minutes of her life. Sarah Eastman was back in town. Sarah fucking Eastman. The girl had confused her and made love seem so clear at a time when things were anything but. Why now? She hurried to the car. She hurried to where her car was parked, flooded with thoughts and memories of Sarah when life was easier and her emotions were untamed. What's the problem, Fred? She stood taller when she was in uniform. The boots added a few inches, and when she met Fred in his office in the front of the store, she looked him straight in the eye. He wasn't a fan of female sheriffs and was vocal that he hadn't voted for her, but Natalie didn't feel threatened by him. His back had a slight hunch, and the skin of his arm swayed loosely past the short sleeve button-up he wore. Fred was past his prime and had stopped caring about a lot since his wife died of cancer six years ago, two years after Natalie returned to Spruce Mountain. His nasty attitude was hard to swallow, but Natalie attributed it to loss of love and brushed it off whenever they interacted. There was a damn dog on the loose and was digging through the trash, shredded some bags so there's garbage everywhere, probably has rabies too. A bit of spittle bubbled up in the corner of his mouth. Natalie looked, Natalie looked away under the pretense of studying the few people sprinkled in the store. Did you see the dog? Fred adjusted his pants and folded his arms. Well, I didn't, but Tyler did. Where's Tyler? I'll need to talk to him. He's on break. Natalie nodded. Let's not bother him yet. Why don't you show me the trash can? Fred motioned to her and followed him to the back of the store and unlocked the door that led to the lar two large dumpsters. One was supposed to be for recycling, but Fred never, op never obliged and filled both with cardboard, rotting food, and things from Spruce Market. Fred, why don't you get your coat? It's cold outside. He waved her off. I'm fine. He pushed open the door and pointed to the only bag of garbage that was barely torn, open at the bottom and left beside the dumpster. See? Look at that. I'm going to start spraying more garbage with ammonia. That'll teach that mutt. Fred, I can't have you doing that. It's animal cruelty, and honestly, the mess here will take all of about 30 seconds to clean up. He threw up his hand. Are you going to do it, Sheriff? Natalie sighed. I'm sorry you have to clean it up, but it's not bad. I'm sure Tyler will do it for you. I'll do my best to find the dog who did this to your trash. Natalie bit her tongue at the flagrant abuse of the recycle bin. It was a constant battle with the trash company from Sawyer Disposal, the service from the next town. They took the recycled materials away for free, but charged customers for garbage. Fred was, try Fred was trying to circumvent the system by covering the top of the trash with layers of cardboard on pickup days, so he only had to pay the minimum. He had been warned twice. The third violation would result in having the recycle bin removed and replaced with another trash dumpster. Sawyer Disposal gave her departments a head up as a courtesy. So you're telling me I can't protect my own property? You call me and we'll take care of it. No, gums, no guns or harmful chemicals, Fred. Are we clear? He squinted his eyes with anger, but slowly nodded. Fine, but you need to find that dog. I will. Natalie checked her watch. Is Tyler off his break yet? Fred opened the door for her and called out for Tyler, who jogged over to them. What's up? He was slightly winded, and Natalie was disappointed as the smell of cigarette smoke wafted over her. He was 17 and one of the few teenagers who wasn't on her radar as being a troublemaker. Tell me about the dog and what you saw exactly. Natalie pulled out her notepad. Was it big, small, what color? 
Tyler bounced on the balls of his feet and while described the while he described the alleged ra- rabid dog. He was big and he ran when I yelled at him. He got away with something, but I don't know what was in the bag. She, he shrugged. He? Natalie asked. Tyler nodded in confirmation. Did he seem threatening at all? Another shrug. Not really. He just seemed kind of skittish, like he knew he was doing something wrong. Describe him, please. He was brown with long hair and about this tall. Tyler held his hand down to mid-thigh, indicating the dog was good-sized. Wait, did he look like a golden retriever? At his blank stare, Natalie pulled up images of golden retrievers on her phone. She found the picture of a dog that looked like the dog, the happy dog she just met a few minutes ago. Like this? Tyler pointed at the phone. Yes, just like this. The dog was Nat- the dog that Natalie had met and petted 20 minutes ago was not a crazed, rabid dog. She turned to Fred. Rabid? He motioned to Tyler. Well, he was all excited when he told me. I was just delivering the message. Natalie kept quiet. Natalie kept quiet and flipped her notebook shut. I will keep a lookout for the dog. If you see it, call me. In the meantime, get the trash cleaned up and put in the correct bin. Here's my card. She handed her business card to Tyler, dismissing Fred. Natalie walked out of Spruce Market and looked down the street up at the craft store. No cars were parked out front. Both Mrs. Bennett and Sarah were gone. The dog, the sweet golden retriever who wagged his tail back and forth when she rubbed his soft fur, had also disappeared. Was he there when she left the store in a hurry to get away from Sarah? She couldn't remember. Surely he belonged to someone. No animal that beautiful and sweet was astray. That afternoon gave her a lot to think about. What was Sarah doing back in town, and who was missing a dog? (laughs) Very good. Very good. That was awesome. That was awesome. So uh, I hope that my little cat who is meowing at me now he's, he's relaxed, will stop. (laughs) Fortunately, I muted myself before while you were doing the reading, (laughs) but I will mute myself again because we don't want to interrupt Allie's reading. So Allie, are, are you ready? I am ready. All right. Take it away. All right. As I talked about briefly at the beginning, I'm trying to teach myself how to write short stories. You know, it's it's a, a challenge for me. You know, I always joke in the South that it takes us, you know, 200 words just to say hello and introduce ourselves. But um, I grew up in a very small town in central Florida till about 20 years ago. They didn't even have a stoplight. And there was some pretty, pretty routine activities in the summertime that was bringing in the hay and the annual homecoming at the church. That was a big social event. So this is uh, the crux of the short story that I'm going to read to you this morning. It's called From the Cradle to the Stone. Cat Linder stretched her long arms and legs. A soft purr from beside her turned into a whine. Do you really have to get up this early? Cat rolled over to face her lover. Yes, Lauren, I do. There are animals to feed and chores to do. Lauren let out a huff. But it's Saturday, and I don't have to open the shop until 8. None of the ladies in this town will die if they can't get their hair done, Cat stated with a smile as she reached over to brush a stray strand of hair from Lauren's face. They may tell you they will, but I promise they are safe. Maybe more cranky, but it's not the end of their world. Are you saying my job is any less important than yours? Good heavens, no. Someone has to keep the ladies of our sleepy little town looking their best, and you do a remarkable job of it. Lauren ran her hand through Cat's thick hair. I think you're about due for a trim, too. Please, God, don't let me come into the shop. I'm not sure I'm strong enough to survive the inquisition I get every time I'm there. Lauren chuckled. I'll give you a cut tomorrow if I can pull you away from those chickens long enough. Love you. My love, you have a deal. Cat leaned over and kissed her. Now go back to sleep. You can get another hour or two before you head to work. Stop by and see me before you go. I will, Lauren pulled the covers over her body. It's already cold without you in here. Cat shook her head. Do I need to turn on some heat? Lauren pouted. Thanks, but it's not the same. Cat shrugged. It's the best I have to offer. By far, not the best. But we'll both be late if you surrender to my womanly charms. Lauren laughed when she saw the change in Cat's face. Dear Lord, woman, you are going to be the death of me, Cat teased. Maybe so, but not for at least 60 years or more. Cat pulled on her jeans and slipped into her boots. Just 60? Lauren held back her laughter. Yeah, after that, I'm trading you in for two 30-year-olds. Cat was buttoning her shirt. She placed her hands over her heart. That was a serious blow to my ego. 
Baby, you should know by now. You're the only one for me. Cat sat on the edge of the bed and leaned in to kiss Lauren. Or the only one that will put up with you. Ouch. I reckon I deserve that. You did. Leave yourself wide open. Are you coming home for lunch? Can't. I'm book solid with coloring and burns today. The big homecoming dinner is tomorrow at the church. Well, damn. I promised Gran we'd go with her. But I ain't wearing a dress. I think the congregation would die from heart attacks if you did, Lauren Small. I'm sure Grant has a nice outfit selected and ironed for you. I hope it's black slacks and white shirt. You look ravishing in that. Kat grinned at Lauren with her lopsided grin. You are on a roll today. I'm just getting warmed up. Burn a blanket ship was my third appointment today, and she always has something crass to say. Should I come beat her up? Heavens no. She's in her 70s. I'll keep the radio and dryers going to drown her out. That's my girl. Love you, Cat stood to leave. I love you too. Have a good day and be safe. Always, Cat said and left the room, bounded down the stairs. She had nearly reached the front door when her grand called out from the kitchen. Catherine Ann Linder, I know you're not skipping breakfast this morning. Cat turned around and walked into the kitchen. Her grand had added scrambled eggs to a company of the Accompany the bacon and toast on a plate. Pour your juice and coffee. Yes, Gran. Cat finished her breakfast and began re rinsing the dishes. Don't forget about the homecoming tomorrow. Lauren's al already reminded me, she said, too busy to come home for lunch, getting all those ladies spruced up. I've got an appointment with her at noon, so I'll make sure she gets something to eat. She's going to need fuel for the busy day ahead of her. I'll try to get the breakfast into her, but she's worse than you about eating. If you still have some of those muffins you cooked, I'm sure she'd eat one with some coffee. I guess that's better than nothing. She handed Kat a thermos of coffee. Don't forget to take water breaks. I know you forget all about them when you're busy, but it's important. It's going to be a hot one today. Yes, ma'am. I'll see you later. Thanks for a great breakfast. You're welcome. Now go before I make you seconds. You're getting too thin. I burn off all the calories you get into me, Grand. I love every mouthful, though. I'll come out in a little bit together the eggs. I'll bring you something cool to drink. You'll need it by then. Cat stepped onto the porch and frowned at the red sky blooming across against the horizon. I hope that doesn't mean a storm is blowing in. I've got to get the hay bale before it hits. Other than the ominous sky, the morning was beautiful. The air was filled with the sweet odor of honeysuckle, which grew along the fence and the drying grass she had cut the day before. Birds filled the air with song, and the moon hung low in the sky. Entering the barn, Cat went straight to work. There were hogs and chickens to feed. Ike, the ornery, ornery old black tomcat, called out loudly when Cat spotted her. I know you want some food, too. Cat filled his bowl and started her chores. After feeding the hogs, Cat grabbed a bucket of chicken scratch and headed out for the chicken run. She took a small basket with her. Gran had offered to collect the eggs, but some of the hens could get aggressive, and Cat didn't want them pecking her hands. Gran wasn't young any longer, and her skin had become thin and prone to tearing, so Cat tried to minimize the potential injuries for the one she loved so dearly. Cat had moved in with her Gran right after graduating high school. Her grandpa couldn't keep the small farm and died within a year of her graduation. Her parents lived about 20 minutes away in the next town, but Cat didn't see much of them anymore. Grant had invited them to the homecoming, but it was rare that they would participate in any family event. While her grand was warm and loving, Cat's parents had grown distant and aloof toward their eldest child. At first, their behavior hurt Cat's feelings, but Gran and Lauren were all the family she needed. Damn it, she cried out when a hen pecked her hand. Time to leave memory lane behind and focus on the day. Cat sat on the basket of eggs. Cat set the basket of eggs outside the enclosure and returned to the barn. There was one final animal Cat needed to tend to before she started working on the hay. Inside the barn, a pony waited for her arrival. Danny was a pinto and Welsh pony mix. He stood barely to Cat's hip, but he made up in heart what he lacked in stature. Cat had rescued him from the local shelter when the owner's child was too old and disinterested in the animal. Danny was 16 partially blind and losing his hearing, but he always welcomed Cat when she entered his stall and filled his feed and water troughs. A punny was no help on the farm, but Cat couldn't bear that he was locked into a tiny paddock at the shelter. 
his back door to the his back door to the stall was opened every morning, and after eating, Danny would find Cat if she was working out in the pastures. He would graze on the tender grass and rest in the shade until she turned the tractor off. Then he would emerge and approach her for a petting session. It's time to bail some hay, my friend. Cat gently ran her hand down the horse's neck. I'm sure I'll be seeing you later. Cat walked over to the, her granddad's tractor. The orange paint on the aging Massey Ferguson was fading, but the motor still purred. She checked the fuel and, fu and fluid levels before climbing into the seat and driving it from the barn. The bailing machine was teetering on the verge of being an antique, but it too had been well maintained and served them well. Most farmers in the area had upgraded to the large roll systems, but Cat preferred the smaller bales. She took a warm ball cap, Annette, from the gear shift and placed it on her head. Cat had nearly 10 acres cut, dried, and in rows ready to be baled. It would take all day to finish the job, but she worried rain was moving in and she couldn't risk losing the hay. Uh, she would sell and use for Danny. Cat was tempted to ask her grand for help until Cat remembered her grand had an appointment at the salon. She would finish the baling and go back to drop the baler and hook up a flatbed trailer. It would be slow going with, with one person, but she would do her best. Cat had almost finished one field when she saw a grand approach with a large glass of water. She was parched and needed a cool drink. Grand frowned when she saw the number of bales on the ground and knew Cat would work until the job was done. Thanks, Grand, Cat said when she handed her the glass. I finished the coffee, so your timing with the water is perfect. You've got a lot on the ground already, but you still have the larger field to go, right? Yes, ma'am. It's going to be a long day, but I'll get it done. I'll come back in a little bit with a jug of lemonade if you'll drink it. You know I will, Cat, drain the rest of the water. Thanks, Grand. You're welcome. Her Grand took the glass and strolled across the field as Cat returned to the tractor. Thelma Jean Linder was cut from thick cloth and knew that Cat was just as tough, but she worried about her working so hard. She reached the yard and saw Lauren coming out of the house. Do you have a second? Sure, Gran. What's up? Lauren saw the frown on the woman's face. Is everything okay? I was wondering if you could do my hair in the morning. I know ha I have an appointment at noon, but I'd like to stay and help Cat with the hay. There's weather moving in and she'll work all night to keep the hay from spoiling. Of course I can. I told Cat I'd give her a trim tomorrow, too. I'll call Miss Doris and see if she wants to move into your slot, allowing me to close at four. Then I can come help. That would be great. I've tried talking Cat, talking to Cat about getting someone to help, but no one wants to work in the hot sun these days. I can understand that. I can't find a receptionist worth a damn, Lauren said. We've got a bunch of eggs, so I'm going to make a bowl of egg salad for sandwiches. I'll bring you some when it's ready so you can have lunch. That should give Cat time to finish bailing. I can drive the tractor while she loads the bales. I can get something to eat if you'd rather just stay with Cat. Grand shook her head. It will take her several hours in the large pasture, so I have time. You know she won't be pleased to learn that you skipped your appointment. It'll be too late before she finds out. Are you going to see her before you leave? She asked me to stop by if I had time. Grand smiled. Don't mention my plan to her. She really needs my help, and even then, I'm not sure we'll finish. We'll get it done, Lauren promised. I'll see you soon. Good luck with all the old hens, Green said with a chuckle in them and walked inside. And that's chapter one. Very, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Great readings. Thanks to both of you. So you. I have to know, uh, Chris, why you moved from Washington State, blue liberal state Washington to Kansas that it's getting redder every day, isn't it? There. Oh, well, it's Missouri, uh, right next door to Kansas, um, right on the border. But so my dad was in the military. Uh -huh. And so we grew up overseas. I lived in Turkey, Germany, and then my dad retired in California. And I was so I was born in Washington. And then we moved around the country, um, you know, spending like six months here, three months there until my dad got assigned over to Turkey. So I actually started school in Turkey oh, wow. and did all of my elementary school in Germany. And then when we came back uh, in middle school, it was California. And then my dad retired. And then he the only job he could get was in Missouri. So we moved okay. to Missouri when I was a teen and I have lived here ever since because my parents live here and my sister lives here. She actually lives just down the street from me. So 
and we've always been a close family and I don't have any like aunts and uncles really. So it's just us. So we just kind of stick together, even though it's a shitty red state, you know, both Kansas and Missouri, believe it or not, Kansas is more liberal than Missouri. So go figure. Yeah. Well, I don't know, Missouri. Yeah. I remember. My, so my uh, sister and uh, her husband lived in, uh, they went to, they lived in Kansas right on, on that uh, border there because he mm-hmm. went to University of Kansas in Lawrence. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that isn't there like Missouri, it's like the Missouri Kansas border right there. Anyways. There, you know, yeah. At, at that time, he said it was, you know, it was pretty, pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Lawrence is a college town, so it's it's very liberal. I mean, like the big cities are in Kansas and Missouri. They're both. Uh, sorry, if that if you can hear that, I'm sorry. It's probably telling me about this podcast. So, um, <laughs> so uh, it's just all the big cities are blue, yes. and all the little ones are just right. you know are red. So I'm right. thankfully I'm in I'm in the red here. Um, so that's nice, but. It's also super cheap to live in the Midwest, which, yeah, you know, either coast, um, it, there's, there's good and bad on, you know, for both. It's like, I would love to live on the East coast, um, even the West, either coast, but I can't afford it. Right. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. I grew up in, uh, Illinois. So, um, yeah, but uh, I didn't really like it. The four seasons, although now oh, I'm, yeah. somewhere, I'm in Washington and Washington where I live actually has four seasons. So yeah. we get really cold weather here on the East side of the state. Anyways, yeah. I just, I, I thought maybe you did it like when you were an adult and I'm like, yeah. why in the world would you move from no. Oh, Washington no. to uh, almost everybody lives here because a, they grew up here. They were born and yeah. raised. It's yeah. amazing how many people have roots here, like just, and don't want to leave for that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not that person. Uh, I figured, you know, once it's just me and my sister, we actually had talked about moving to Portugal and she's looked into it yeah. um, and, and living there because it is, it, it's actually fairly inexpensive to live there. She's a hundred percent remote. I could write full time. Uh, we could make it work. You know, it's one of those where we're just kind mm-hmm. of waiting to see how my dad's doing and stuff. So, right. yeah. um, right. but right. it's once family's gone, I'm gone. It's one of those where it's like, I'm out. There's no reason for me to be here other than family. But you said uh, now big cities that you've lived. Have you lived in small towns before? Because um, I'm sure when I was a child, I did. <laughs> oh, actually in Germany, like Germany where I lived, because uh, my dad's always made a point to live off base so that we would learn the cultures of, of every country we're in. And I lived in a small town in Germany and it's not, it's called Homburg, not Hamburg. It's H-O-M-B-U-R-G. It's a small town. Mm-hmm. My mom was a hairdresser down the street. Uh, my dad, I don't know how far away the base was, maybe like a 40 minute drive. And it was a small town and everybody knew me they knew us because we were the americans that lived in town nice. so like i couldn't get away with anything because oh we saw your daughter like riding her bike without her hand you know hand hands free you're riding her bike and you know and i, I everybody snitched on me <laughs> everybody snitched on me so that was probably the smallest town i lived in with of course everybody watching and knowing me yeah, I was just wondering if you pulled on some of your personal experiences, but that's that's interesting that sounds like small time living in Germany is very civil, similar to small time living in the that US. Is. Maybe it's maybe it's true everywhere. It's like, you know, and you're in a small town, everybody knows everybody sort of right. Yeah. yeah. And they love, and since my mom is a hairdresser, I mean, of course, you know, they go in to get their hair and I was laughing. Cause like Allie's telling her story and I'm laughing. Cause my mom, like all of this is kind of related, you know, and small town is hairdressing and that's where you get yeah. your gossip. And that's how my mom knew every bad thing I ever did. And I just thought she was all knowing, Oh my God, how did she know that? It's because yeah. like everybody snitched on me. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. You can't get away with anything in a small town. <laughs> you can't. I mean, it's good for like, if you need something like 9,000 or 9,000, like like 90 people show up immediately. It's, you know, yeah. whereas here in the suburbs now, like, I don't even know my neighbors across the street. I don't know their names. You know, I know my one directly right across from me. I know her name, but I don't know the, you know, it's, it's, it's a different vibe. It's a more private vibe. Um, you know, and I think at different levels of your life, you appreciate small town versus the privacy of, of, of a bigger town. Um, 
and plus there's more to do in bigger towns there's not as much so I mean there's a give and take with both I mean I'm sure you know when I wherever I end up you know my final days hopefully it's a smaller town I think I think I'd want to go to a smaller town but I actually picked I picked a town on the west coast for this thing uh and also I picked a small town sheriff because a it's so charming small town sheriff is super charming and i'm also an erper and we have uh you know i don't know if y'all watched winona erp or not but uh you should um i have it's awesome yeah. i love that so yeah so i kind of was like it'd be kind of fun to write about a sheriff because sheriff nicole hot is uh you know fantastic and i thought it would be fun to kind of capture that whole like what what control does a sheriff have? How much influence does a sheriff have? And I just thought it would be kind of cool to to try to explore that. So that's why yeah. I, I picked. And I love the uh, I love the West Coast. Um, like Seaside, Oregon is one of my favorite places to go visit and climb and hike. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so I just said, well, I'm just going to make up a place because I have learned that if you use real places in your books, like people will like Google that and they will tell you that you had something wrong. <laughs> like I did I was I did this um I wrote a in touch I wrote about a hockey player and uh she lived on like 26th floor in some I don't know I picked like a big town in Vermont or something and they're like somebody's like there is no building in this town that is 26 stories high and I'm like of course so now I have to use fake towns so then they can't argue with me about you know something I I no there is there are 26 floors (laughs) Yeah, but I lost on that one, so I learned. But now, Allie, you've been in in small towns. I mean, I know you live in Pensacola right now, which isn't exactly yeah. small, but you've definitely you grew up in uh, small. Yeah, towns. definitely grew up in small towns. You know, I've I've been in bigger cities. You know, for work, I've been in Memphis and in Milwaukee, and mm-hmm. just while there is so much more to do, it's just it's good to be home in a, as, yeah. in a small location. It's just, the people are just so much different, you know, right. uh, you, you, like Chris said, you can't get away with anything in a small town because everybody knows everybody. And, uh, you know, it's, it's what I prefer, you know, being in a small town and, and close to water, you know, I have to have moving water somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah my well, favorite have- place was, uh, was Cleelum, which is small, about 3000 people. And I love yeah. living there. It's great. Yeah. Now, uh, my uh, quote unquote grandparents, not really my grandparents, but it was just, you know, an older couple that my parents kind of know, knew throughout a lot of their lives. Um, my, uh, they lived in Mount Sterling, Illinois. So you were talking about Illinois. And I was like, I used to go there all the time. Uh, we used to go at my, uh, like I said, my family, quote unquote, they had pig farm. So like everything Allie was saying, I was like, you are talking about my life right now. Like, this is my life. Like, let's go on the farm and let's go take care of the pigs and feed them and everything like that. I mean, I think that I've had such a well-rounded life uh, living all the different places and then doing small town and learning all the small town lifestyles and then living in the bigger cities. Um, like I said, I they all bring something different to us. Uh, mm-hmm. They they mold us, they change us. Um, so like I I'm game to live anywhere as long as I can, you know, still work and write and things like that. But I'm, I, I can live in a huge city or I can live in a small town. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about romance a little bit. So that definitely is, is your niche, right? You haven't, uh, you haven't really ventured outside of that. Have you, have you done, you haven't done any sort of um, paranormal or science fiction or mystical or anything like that, right? <laughs> well, I did a thriller, uh, sort of, um, with two other writers, uh, with Megan Ulrich and Maggie Cummings. We did Against All Odds, but it was a romance, but it was also about a, ser- a serial killer who, um, like, the two survivors of his killing spree actually end up together. And so his goal is to have a hundred percent on his killing spree. So he's like kind of stalking them, trying to, to kill them. So there's some sort of suspense there. Yeah. Um, and then I wrote erotica, but yeah, romance is, is like, you know, 98% of what I write. 
ever ever thought of uh, venturing venturing out of of romance and you know doing you know paranormal or sci-fi or um, historical or you know. I actually I'm kind of secretly writing but now you're the first to know uh <laughs> I'm kind of secretly writing a dystopian oh, awesome cool. I love dystopian movies and even the books like The Hunger Games and yeah, Divergent too. and Ashes. I love all of that because there's just something so like what would happen if something other than a war like took down our society? Would I survive? And I, my whole life, I, I have been like, I've just been so fascinated by like zombie stuff or any sort of apocalyptic events. Would I survive? And I think about my neighborhood here, would I survive? Yeah. And uh, so I decided to, you know, maybe I should write a story about it. So I kind of have something in the works. Um, I'm not very far on. It's something I don't have a contract with. Uh, I might self-publish it. I don't know. Uh, we'll see, you know, as far as I get, but I love it. I love the concept of it. Um, I love kind of uh, where it's going. So we'll see. We'll see I do too. I on. love dystopian. Um, yeah. yeah. That's one that you haven't done, Allie, right? You've never done a dystopian. Uh, not that's been published. No, I had one that I just mm. kind of played around with for years, but I just mm. I need to really clean it up. Oh, mm. you should. I love dystopian. Yeah. So, I think a anyways, lot of people do. You heard yeah. it here. You heard it first here at AAA <laughs> Storytelling. Chris Bryant's doing a dystopian so yeah. for dystopian fans look 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 for that and Allie yeah, really. hopefully you'll finish yours and people can look for your dystopian novel yeah, yeah I love them I'll I'll read them like I said and they're so like the movie aspect of it I love that people can be that creative to try to build a world outside of our world but still inside of our world yep. you know? right so that's that's such a hard concept for me like without copying everything that's already been done you know you're dealing with like all the like even silo like the series on whatever apple or whatever i don't know if either of you have seen that i haven't um, seen that one no. and that you need to watch it like okay. it's, it's like the first two episodes are like uh but then it gets really really good okay. so yeah. uh so i recommend that you know and of course then all the divergent series and like it, so you have to try to figure out how does our community or our society crumble without it being because of war, nuclear war, something like that, like, or a zombie apocalypse. I mean, what, what could cause us to, to just fall apart. And so that's, that's, that's the hard thing, trying to figure that out and make that work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. kind of what I'm, what I'm trying to, yeah. who knows if it works. We'll see. We'll see. I'm sure it will. So uh, what's the what's the most challenging thing about writing uh, contemporary romance novels for you? Um, I think, you know, I think there's the, the belief and I think this is somewhat true with romance is that people are like, well, it's like a cookie cutter. You know, you, you're just you're changing names. You're writing the same story. You're just changing the names and the occupation. And I think the hard thing to do is to keep it fresh and different having different yeah. characters, uh, having flawed characters, even situation. You know, I write the emotional side of contemporary romance. I don't, I, my, it's not a storytelling. I don't, I don't tell the story. It's more about the emotional journey that the characters go yeah. on. Okay. You know, some people are, are plot based, minor character based. Uh -huh. So, uh, so to keep it fresh, I have to like really get in the head of the characters. Like, um, you know, just, and have different ones to make sure that I have different ones. Like, you know, I have femme, I have mask, I have, I write, I'm writing a non-binary character now. Um, so it's just, it's just keeping, keeping it interesting and not keeping it cookie cutter, yeah. you know, cause yeah. romance gets a lot of dings for things like, oh, this is the same story. Oh, this is, you know, the, the dialogue sounds the same, every single book that this person writes or whatever. So, but it also sells the most. I mean, contemporary romance is, is right. the bread and butter of, of uh, the community and like, go ahead and hate it. But I mean, you're also secretly reading it. So um, oh, yeah. I think it's, <laughs> yeah, it's one of those where I like hate it, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed it um yeah so just just keeping it fresh and and not doing that like I said the cookie cutter like having that that formula that we all have to follow the arc um at least you do with BSB you have to do like 
connection, how do they break apart or what keeps them apart, which I have a really hard time with. I have a hard time with conflict because not every relationship has a massive thing that breaks them apart. You know, sometimes it's simple as, you know, distance. And I've had several books where distance has kept them apart because in real life, I mean, half of this shit, if I read, if my life was, was some of the books I've read, I would hate myself. I would just go somewhere like, like communication is key. And so many people just like storm off or, you know, drive off and never talk to them again. And it's just like, that's not even realistic. So it's hard to keep it realistic and fresh. And, you know, especially after writing 20 of them now, I'm like, okay, what, what, what happens next? You know? Yeah. How about you, Allie? Uh, I, you know, I mean, I know you write contemporary romance, although you really like um, adding other sort of different, it, it's not, uh, it's got a, a different feel to it. I think your contemporary romance, but what's, what's the hardest yeah. thing? For you? I mean, ro- romance sells, you know, mm-hmm. I think and nobody would disagree with that. You know, I, li- I don't like romance to be the, the focus of my book. I, I want it to be more of adventures of the characters. And I pick some unusual characters. You know, I don't do the, the, you know, actresses. coffee shop owner. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I do different things, you know, I, in hopes that most readers can relate to my type of characters. You know, it's everyday type people, not the big politicians or uh, movie starlets or whatever. And you know, that's that's my focus, just more everyday type people. Mm-hmm. And that's so important to have because that's that's really our life. You know, I mean, that's who yeah. we are. Yeah. So I think that's 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 a win for sure. Yeah. Like yeah. you're right. It's always like a movie starlet or, you know, something like that. And that's, I like writing, like I, I'll have one, like one, st- one, mo- one movie. <laughs> I wish I have one book like that, or I'll have like, you know, like I love catch like the book that I wrote about the football off the first female offensive coordinator yeah. in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, stuff like that is really interesting. And then yes. like the research is, I love it. The fantastic yeah. research work. Cause I love football and it's getting ready to start. And I can't tell you how happy I am by that. But then, you know, you, you write about other things too. I do have uh, you know, a book that I based on kind of like the bachelorette. It was a TV story behind the scenes of, of this show, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's just, yeah. I mean, you just, you, it, you take normal people and you put them in different um, situations, different jobs or whatever, and then draw from that, like their experiences. What could they possibly yeah. have in this job that brings to their character that has molded them? And that's where the fun is. That's where you get to really right. get into the character and get to know them. And and how would they handle this situation? And it's like, it's so hard to write contemporary romance that stays, uh, that holds itself over like a 10 year period you know, or even, you know, a 20 year period, will this book still stand as far as being, you know, uh, correct, uh, politically correct or whatever, you know, it's hard to, to maintain that. And it's, and my, my editors always reminding me, don't date yourself by putting in certain like TV shows or, uh, something that people can go, Oh, that was big. And, you know, 2000, 15 you know things like that so you have to kind of keep in mind you're writing a book that is supposed to stand time like 20 years from now they can pick up jolt and be like oh yeah you know this this still i can still read this and there's nothing like offensive or or i said something wrong so you always have to kind of keep that so it's always a challenge to write romance you know you know science and space and stuff like that i mean you get to make your own world you know, I think we that's have to, challenging. I think yeah, that's really Oh, for challenging. sure. I can't do it. There's no way I could write an alternative universe and like, there's no way. Absolutely no way. Like kudos to the people who could do it. I cannot do it. I know. I can't Me do neither. it. I, that's why I, anything that I do that's sci-fi, it's sci-fi light. So, you know, you were talking about the the reality. I've seen a couple of books, which I thought were, were fun books to read about reality shows, you know, the dating mm-hmm. ones, whatever. Um, and I think I even saw one, uh, I, I think I read one about, uh, you know, the reality show with physical challenges where, you know, oh, you know hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. but I have never seen, you know, so there's this new show. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Yes, probably. The ultimatum. Yes. yes. Oh my God. So I am waiting for somebody to do a book uh, based on that concept of uh, reality TV, hmm. because man, I just, I was like, oh, this is, this is just 
chock full of drama. You know, it would make such a great book. I, who, who knows? Maybe I'll maybe I'll take a shot at it. Uh, there you go. I need and a new so project. <laughs> the only so because I wrote the, the the serendipity and that that is based on the Bachelorette show. Yeah. Um, the only issue that's hard to do is that you have to name a bunch of people at once and trying to keep those, the names and keep the interest so that people don't lose who you're talking about, like right, within the, cause right. you're, you're introducing like, okay, this character here are, you know, Mindy and Samantha. And then you have this and it's like, it's overwhelming. Right. Like I, I read a book one time, uh, one of my friends wrote a book and introduced like 20 people within the first chapter. And I was like, I just like, <laughs> like, I, I couldn't stay focused on that. So that's why I wrote behind the scenes so that I could gradually introduce the people. Because if you yeah. like drop a bunch of names at once, people will just check out because it's right. overwhelming, right. you know, because it's not a visual thing, you know, the ultimatum we know, oh, this person is this. And by the way, I like, I watched the queer ultimatum. Like that was a hot fucking mess. Can we curse here? Are yes, curse? yes. Okay. All right. If not, you might have to bleep me. No. But and, and I'm watching the. I just finished. Like uh, they just dropped the final episode of the second season. Uh, not queer, but it's just it's hetero straight. But I watched it. I mean, I I, I watched. I can't help it. I love these shows, and I just I watched the uh, the um, the reunion. Like that that was just dropped. So I so I'm caught up. I know everything about it. Yeah, I well, the else I I didn't watch the hetero version, but I did. I loved. I couldn't. I, I'm like you, guilty guilty pleasure. Yes, it I is. Had to, I, and it was just it's ridiculous dyke drama, but it was mm -hmm. so good, so good. Yeah, and then you know, and it's funny because, um, yeah, you. Uh, some of those people were a hot mess, and it's like, and I called the real villain of the thing, like on episode three. I'm like that person isn't the villain it's really this person's the villain so yeah oh, wait what do you who who did you think was the villain vanessa the the one with uh oh uh the physical therapist uh, i can't remember who vanessa is now i just remember the name because well, i have such I, hatred yeah, I mean, and anger the, towards it <laughs> she was the one who thought who wasn't vanessa was vanessa the one i can't no, i gotta look was the Vanessa the one who uh, just thought, oh, I've got her, the sweet, wonderful, what's her name? Was that one? I'm, I am typing right now because we are going to talk. Yeah, Vanessa. So Vanessa, why is Vanessa from the Ultimatum so awful is actually a thing on uh, Google. Okay. Yes. And um, it says here, her immaturity, selfishness, and thoughtless comments. Um Vanessa was she was she was Ray. She was evil from the beginning, wasn't she? I Pretty much. She... So Xander and Vanessa. Xander, yes. Xander. Xander was adorable, and it was just like, yes. oh "Come gosh, here, she... come here." I know she was adorable. So yeah, so that's yeah. <laughs> Allie's like, "Oh, what? what stop!" <laughs> you have to watch it, Allie. Oh my gosh, you if you watch the first two and you are sucked in, you are totally sucked in. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I no. love. You know, the thing about those is like a reality show. I mean, I in my head, I'm like, I want this to be true. I want this, you know, because it's so hard to meet people nowadays. You know, before yeah. it was, you know, when we were younger, it was you just met them by at random, like at a grocery store and or at like the laundromat or at a concert or something like that. You know, this is before the Internet, before online dating, before apps and things like that. A lot of people nowadays don't understand that it was a lot harder to meet people. Plus, you know, we were in the closet and we had to protect ourselves. And so, right. Right. like, we've really paved the way for a lot of the queer youth. Yeah. And uh, shows like this are fascinating to me because I'm like, I hope they're real. I know in my heart they're not. I know in my heart that these people just really want a shot at showbiz. And right. Right. But I, I kid myself and I tell myself, like, they're doing this for love. Like, they love it. They're doing it for love. They're doing it for heart. love. <laughs> but my head's like, you're stupid. Yeah. Like you're dumb. Yeah. If you think if this, I'm like, I'm like, I, I love this. But my heart's like, please finish watching this. And my head's like, stop watching this. So there, I, it's a conflict. These shows are a yeah. conflict for me. But I do. They are a guilty pleasure. I agree in it. They are yeah. a guilty pleasure. Guilty pleasure. All right. Well, we've already talked about conflicts and complications. You told us about that. And um, so you said so. Um, what 
book would you say you had to do the most amount of research for? Um, to get it like right on spot on. Well, shoot. See, look at me. I'm shoot. No, you, can say, you can say shit. <laughs> shit. Go ahead. Um, I had two. I had two that I had to make sure the research was spot on. And the first one was taste, uh, because I was dealing with a culinary student uh, who fell for her teacher. Um, so I went to, we have over in Kansas, which is like two minutes away. Um, I, there's Johnson County uh, Community College has a culinary center. So I reached out to them and they let me uh, sit in uh, for a week and watch how a culinary class really works. Like, oh, cause wow. I needed to make sure that I got yeah. it right because Good we could you. like wow. pretend we could pretend like we know what happens, you know, in a culinary mm -hmm. school, you know, yeah. from like movies or whatever, but I had to make sure I got it right. Because like I said, there aren't 26 story buildings and wherever in Vermont, you know, there just aren't. So I need to make sure <laughs> I got this right. So, um, yeah, so I had the best time learning like how they, how they do it. And it was just so interesting because they have stations, but then like they all have to taste each other's food. Like the instructor goes up and teaches. So there's like desks on one half of the kitchen. Like it's a huge, massive place. And uh, so the, the, the teacher, you know, the instructor tells them how to do whatever. And then they go to their uh, cooking stations and then they, they prepare whatever it is they just learned. And then everybody tastes it. So I got to taste so much food. So I just kind of hung around and, and, and got to taste everything. So that, that was a lot of fun. So learning that, how it actually works. And I'm so glad I did because I would have gotten it all wrong. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And the other thing was catch. Like I had a football, like we have some diehard football fans in our community and I happen to be one of them. And because I think I know so much, I know that I don't know so much. It's one of those where like, I don't want to like, oh, fill in the gap subconsciously, but I needed to learn. Um, so I actually, I talked to several coaches. Like I had, I talked to a couple of coaches in the NFL, uh, Jennifer King being the most helpful, uh, she's with the Washington commander. She's the running backs coach. Okay. And so she was a really good resource for me, um, oh. to get it right. And of course I had it all wrong because coaching is different, you know, behind the scenes versus, right. you know, what you think you see. Mm -hmm. So she was a very valuable resource, but it took forever to reach out. Cause I, I was, uh, I did reach out to another coach, uh, but there was so much going on with the team that it was just impossible to, um, to actually get, uh, that person to, to interview. Plus they also wanted money. So I'm like, I'm right. poor and I can't do that. Right. So yeah. just the fact that there are some people out there who really want to help writers, you know, mm -hmm. get it right. And my advice, I mean, I know you didn't ask for it, but I think like for people who are out there, um, wanting to write stories, um, always talking to somebody in that field is very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. even if it's just like one sentence in your book, you have to nail it. You have to get it right because there are readers out there who know more than you and they will point it out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so even with touch, I have a physical therapist. I actually had dinner with a physical therapist and, and wanted to learn how things are done because I can guess and I can Google, but right. Google isn't right either. You know, it's not always right. It's just whatever anybody wants to put up. Right. So you have to trust with, with somebody in the field. And so, and, and the more you write and the more clout you have, like people are so helpful and willing to, to talk to you about, about whatever subject you're, you're trying to write about. Yeah. How about you, Allie? What's the, what's the book that you had to do the most research for? Uh, probably a terminal event in the ghost of East Texas, because they dealt with mm -hmm. serial killers. And, you know, a lot of internet research. Unfortunately, you know, I couldn't talk to a serial killer. <laughs> Thank God. I mean. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, there's, there's so many. And, you know, just diving into their stories is, is interesting, but scary in, in the same breath. You know, and it's, it's amazing what people have lived through and what has, has turned them into the, the monsters or the creatures that they are. Yeah, it is. It, it it is kind of fascinating. I think serial killers. Yeah. Kind of yeah. I mean, I have mentioned before that once you hit a certain age, like your Friday night is Dateline in 2020, and which one are you <laughs> going to watch first? You know, for sure, because we're so fascinated by that. When you're a kid, you don't care. You have other priorities. <laughs> But, you know, when you're when you're an adult, you're like, oh, my God, that could totally happen. Or I wonder if I knew somebody like that, you know, yeah. or, 
that happened here in Kansas City or in Overland Park. I mean, like, it's always so fascinating. Like, how are people like this? Like, what causes them to be like that? So yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, doing the research on that is, yeah, that would be very hard. Pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah I've. I've I've always, I've wanted to for a couple of years now to do a a story about um, uh, female migrant workers uh, and I and I just can't, I can't find anybody who will who will talk with me uh, about that so I don't know I might make another ploy because I'd really like to do a story about that I think that would be a very interesting uh, story and. Um, it would be a love story, of course, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, <clears throat> the, the female, the, you know, just some of the articles that I've read about that and <clears throat> some of the things that uh, they have to go through and just the, um, you know, the abuse and the sexism and, you know, even, even, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty awful actually. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Uh, wow. We've talked about a lot. Um, final question, mm. hamster or plotter? Me? Yep. Okay. Uh, definitely a pantser. Like I can't plot anything. That's why I could never run a space thing. I can't do any of that. It's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, there's a cat in here. Like there's a cat in this story or, oh, like this happens instead. I just, I have no idea what's going to happen. I just know that I know like at the very beginning, I know who they are, how they're going to meet. I, and I know the ending is always going to be a happy ending. It's the stuff in between. Like I literally turn in like a paragraph just to get the contract because they know me not, by now. They're like, okay. It used to be like, you had to write this whole thing about like, what's going to happen, the plot. And I'm like, Hey, so this is going to happen. I'm writing about this and we'll see what happens. And they're like, okay, right, here you go. Because I have proven myself even as a panster. And I know the older I get and the more I write, the worse it is that I really do need to plot. So I am a panster by, by trade, but in my heart, I really want to be a plotter. Yeah. Allie, Allie panster, right? Yes. Yeah, total <laughs> panster. You know, I tried <laughs> plotting at the beginning and it's just, it was so frustrating because I get so way off course because that's not right. where my characters wanted to go. Mm -hmm. You know, I liked in, in your book, Chris, at the end, uh, how you revealed the dog's name. I thought that was just precious. And, <laughs> you know, it's stuff like that that just kind of, for me at yes. least, it, it just pops up, mm -hmm. you know, and it's. Uh, and it was know, so, it's so funny because it was so unorthodox that um, like I had to get permission to actually write that, like the way, like the way that happened. Cause, and uh, my editor, uh, actually the editor in chief was like, mm, I think you can get away with it, you know, because yeah. it's so different. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I feel like, um, yeah, anyway, I totally interrupted you. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. You're, you're to totally fine. You know, I just, I thought that was very unique and I, I really enjoyed when I got to that point. It's like, oh, yes. <laughs> now I know who the ghost is. Yeah. 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 Cancer all the way. <clears throat> I know yes, that. look and at us. It, We're amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it creates, <laughs> creates uh, huge issues for me. Because after I after I write my first draft, um, <clears throat> I've got to go back through and clean up tons of plot holes, <laughs> tons of inconsistencies, <laughs> because I cannot remember, I can't even remember what eye color I gave them. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, the hair color changes a lot with me. I'm like, is she yeah. blonde, brunette? So, I don't know. But you know, there. I think there's an there is one advantage to being a panster, especially with um, mysteries or romantic intrigue or some of those. Is that if you don't know who the bad guys are, because you haven't, you're just not sure who you're going to write in. Mm -hmm. Then your readers don't either. So there's those surprises are truly surprises because they're surprises to me. They're surprises. Yeah, to, I know, you know what you mean. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can do those twists and turns uh, rather well. Uh, it's just a pain in the rear to, to edit, which is. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, you have a book coming out, right? Like it's almost uh, coming out, right? You want to tell it's, us about that? 
It is actually out right now. It just, it was like released right now. It's September okay. 1st release. Cherish. Cherish. Okay. Cherish. And it, uh, it actually is the uh, general release day is September 12th, but it's available at the, uh, the web store now, uh, the publishing web store. Um, yes. And it's, um, it's, is kind of a, uh, like a beach read summary type story. It's spicy. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a quick read, but my characters from temptation are back and they are helping, uh, this, this new, uh, they have an artist in residence living with them for the summer. Uh, she's 23. She's, you know, everything's in front of her. The whole world is, is her oyster. And she's like super excited about life. But then she, uh, she falls for the, uh, a neighbor that's two houses down and very quiet to herself. It ends up, uh, being, a, an artist, uh, there in the small town of Gota, Massachusetts. And so it's about the Wellingtons kind of helping them get together. Mm. So it's, um, uh, it's spicy. It's age gap. There's a lot of tropes in it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it is available pretty much. If you want to find it, you can find it. Like if you want to read it, it's, it's out there at the BSB store or wait until September 12th for the general release. Yeah. And Ali, you've got one coming out too, right? Besides your yeah. The one that just uh, yeah. just uh, hit hit the airwaves. <laughs> yeah. Besides uh, the short story, there's a a uh, fourth book in the Cast Iron series that's, that's coming out uh, called The Sky People, and it's a continuation. Okay. You know, the characters in the Mountain Whispers books. Um, it'll be book four, and then book five will be out in uh, February. And I'm anticipating that being the last book i don't know you know it's so hard to get rid of some characters and say goodbye so you never know it'll be left open you know to pick up later on if necessary any any other last comments from either of you um chris it was wonderful having you join us today and you know it was very informative on your writing process and you know i really enjoyed you being with us today I appreciate it so much. I'm sorry I was late to this. Uh, thank you for for allowing me to sneak in a little late, and I had a great time. I really, I I love when we're all together. I, I mean, I love seeing you both whenever we're at GCLS or even Lone Star. It's been a while since we've had a Lone Star, but um, mm, yeah, yeah. But it's always so nice to see you, and uh, congratulations on your podcast, and yeah. good luck on the uh, the books, especially the like. I want to see some. I want to see the ultimatum. From Annette, I want to see maybe, that. Maybe, maybe I'll we'll call honestly, it. You know, I honestly thought uh, <laughs> this, this, the last book. Uh, you know, talk, you you talked about it was interesting. You talked about contracts and um, affinity. Well, I mean, for at least for me, they they don't give me a contract until they see the full manuscript. <laughs> they want to read it first because they just don't know what's going to come out of my little right. demented brain, right? <laughs> But here's the interesting thing. The, for the very first time, I got a contract for a trilogy. And wow. I was like, oh, shit. I, I mean, it's real. I mean, I have to <laughs> I have to write all three, you know. So, you know, I, I gave a little teaser uh, for a spinoff trilogy and they sent me a contract for all three. I mean, I said, I have this concept for a trilogy, whatever, but I hadn't written the books yet. And she sent a contract for all three. I was like, oh crap, now I got to write it. So I, I got to write it. I just finished <laughs> the last book in that trilogy, right? Then it's all coming out next year. And then I, I honestly thought, maybe this is the end. Maybe, maybe I just, I'm, maybe I'm done, you know? Uh, so now I feel inspired because now I have an idea. Yeah, <laughs> that's, oh, that's great. great. For me to like yeah. start going. Yeah. Anyways. All right. Yeah, and so don't forget uh, for, for those out there who uh, do follow our uh, YouTube channel, uh, don't uh, forget to check out our YouTube channel, AAA uh, Podcasting and Storytelling. And next month, we will be doing something mystic, mystical. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you know about that. Chris, thank you so much. It's been a, an absolute joy. Love yeah. to Having, Thank having you, you for having me. Our podcast. Thank you. Uh, for anybody who makes a comment or uh, 
question or anything else uh, after we put these uh, podcasts out there on Facebook and everywhere else, we will pull names and uh, give away what free copy, Allie, yeah, free your, copies uh, of your uh, from cradle to. I always get, I, I always want to say from the cradle to the grave, but that's not it. <laughs> I'm singing it right now. <laughs> and uh, <Me> too. <laughs> thank you, uh, Chris, if you, uh, if you offer up. Uh, yes, sing. I'll do <laughs> home, uh, an, uh, a signed copy of home and a signed copy of Cherish. There Love you go. It. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. And we are done. Out.